Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Sabina Sheck. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Studies for Environmental and Urban Studies and SIGU. Thanks, Noel. You're so nice. <laughs> um, welcome to the uh, 2023 BA Symposium. Uh, this year is a little bit different. We have thesis presentations and capstones. So you'll see out in the in the lounge, you'll see capstone posters, and we'll be showing capstone videos as well in between thesis presentations. So it's a full day's worth of events. Um, just a reminder that at 4.30, we're having a party in the courtyard. So um, make sure you come then. Apologies to seniors. We thought you would all be taking your finals last week as usual. That's how they've always done it in the past. But I know some of you have finals today and tomorrow, but I'm glad that you're here and you can attend. Um, we have an exciting day on tap. We have a wide range of topics and um, theses, capstones, um, a lot of creative work. So I hope you can stay for the whole day, but even part of the day is great. Uh, I think I wanted to just quickly thank um, some people, Carlo, Tess, Danielle, for making this all happen, to Topher for teaching the winter colloquium, for Ray for teaching the fall colloquium, to Evan to coordinating the capstones, and um, Christy and Shishi, who are not here, but um, thank them as well. Uh, Professor Konzen, who's in the back, has taught a capstone course, um, and to all the students. So did I forget anybody? Okay, well, if I did, I'll, I'll mention it later because I have the mic. So, all right, well, I want to just turn it over to Professor Carver, who's our capstone coordinator, just to say a few words about the capstones, and then um, we will go into our first session. Thanks, Sabina, and good morning, everyone. Um, I think I know most of you, uh, so I'll just try to I'll try to keep uh, these notes, you know, minimally redundant for those of you who know about the program a lot already. But um, just as a reminder, uh, we have inaugurated a new format for our fourth year's um, summative projects this year. Uh, we have the traditional BA thesis track, which is a research track, an independent research project, but. Because of the nature of our program, because this vast interdisciplinary space of environmental and urban studies has a lot of different uh, modes and formats for engaging with, with the world, we wanted to also open that up uh, for our students. And that's what the capstone track is designed to be, um, especially for students who want to pursue a design related project, usually through the context of an architecture studio class or something like that, or students who want to pursue a creative project, for example, through my writing the city uh, class. So the capstones, uh, in addition to having the the same extremely broad breadth of, of topics, as you will see in the theses, also have a breadth of formats and approaches and styles, um, presentation modes, which you'll see on display um, out in the in the posters, um, as well as in the videos here. So um, I'm really excited to learn more from you all. I've I've gotten to oversee a number of these capstone projects as well as a number of the thesis projects, um, but uh, but most of them are going to be new to me. So I'm I'm looking forward to learning along with you today. Um, I think I will turn it over, I guess, to our first presenter. Introduce, Introduce this. Yeah. So um, our our thesis, we're going to start with our thesis presentations. And um, I don't know if I need to tell anyone in this room this, but since it's being recorded, I'll just let um, our uh, rising fourth years know that the thesis process starts with an application in spring of the third year. Actually, it starts in winter of the third year. And then the application is due in spring of the third year. That's new that we started doing that this past year. Um, and then the students do a two quarter, they do a reading list and some reading over the summer and then a two quarter BA colloquium course in fall and winter. So it's a pretty intensive process. It lasts for over a year and it culminates with the thesis. Um, and congratulations to everybody who's completed their thesis and turned it in and had it evaluated, it's done. And this is the um, the showcase of those the, that work in these presentations. So our first session, is about Chicago. These are not the only theses about Chicago in our uh, that we'll hear about today, but these are focused um, on, on public space, on the reuse of public space, the production and the creation of public space, how um, 
city zoning, city policy, city planning affects um, neighborhoods in Chicago through whether it's infrastructure or transit planning or um, planning for uh, waterways or for how to reuse vacant lots. So we're gonna hear about all of this in, in the next uh, hour and five minutes. And we're gonna start it with Noelle Sue, who is presenting Using the Allotted Space, Community-Based Green Space Creation Through the Repurposing of Publicly Owned Vacant Lots in Chicago. Hello. Whoa. Hey guys. Oh no, the my fonts didn't download. Oh. Okay. No. Okay. Hi guys. My name is Noel Sa. Um, I'll be presenting my BA thesis today. Uh, like Sabina introduced, my thesis is called Using the Allotted Space, Community-Based Green... Oh, sorry. I'm going to start a timer. Can we restart? Can we restart? Um, okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Noel Sa. This is my thesis. It's called uh, Using the Allotted Space, Community-Based Green Space Creation Through the Repurposing of Publicly Owned Vacant Lots in Chicago. Okay. So the core issue I'm tackling here with my thesis can be, um, it's, it's a two-pronged issue. The first part being green space disparity throughout Chicago. Um, I'm not only examining the physical lack of green spaces in lower income neighborhoods, specifically in the West and South Side, but also um, the disparity in approved capital and investment um, throughout the Chicago, um, through the Chicago Parks District, uh, as well as other public entities, um, NGOs, and um, just the, also the disparity in how much money is going into these green spaces. Um, the second part of my is the issue, uh, my core issue, is the high concentration of vacant lots um, in low-income neighborhoods in Chicago. So uh, Chicago has, the city of Chicago owns more than 15,000 uh, unused vacant lots. So there are, are a lot more, but just to make sure I know that these lots are unused, um, I did some filtering and throughout uh, specific departments, um, like the Department of uh, Planning and Development. So I know for a fact that at least 15,000 vacant lots are currently sitting idle uh, under the possession of the city of Chicago. And as you can see in this map here, um, the concentration um, of vacant lots in specific neighborhoods is very vis visibly apparent. Um, I actually just cropped out the north side in this picture because there was just no need to include it. Um, as we can see, there are there are these clusterings of um, high concentration of vacant lots on the west and south side. And these are no more than six or seven, seven neighborhoods out of the 77 that house these this concentration. Um, and I wanted to combine these two urban issues to see how community spaces could be uh, created and also address um, spatialized socioeconomic issues such as uh, the urban heat island effect, um, deteriorating community relations, uh, crime rates in specific public spaces or the spaces in the vacant lots, um, as well as I took a look at the issue of land mismanagement in the Department of um, Planning and Development with these vacant lots and how this sheer uh, quantity of lots is being handled um, under the city's jurisdiction. Okay, so the role of vacant lots. Um, I take a look at, hi Isadora, um, I take a look at vacant lots um, by first uh, addressing the history and background of how these lots came to be. Um, it's one of the 
I think these, this is one of the most important pillars of my thesis is acknowledging how um, brutal historical policies created these concentrations and clusterings uh, in low income neighborhoods of color throughout Chicago. Uh, policies like redlining, urban renewal, broken windows, policing, etc. Um, basically, I go through the history starting from the 50s and how um, important policies of every decade have shaped con this continuous level of disinvestment, um, leading to the high level of clustering that we saw on the other slide. Uh, the second part is um, taking a look at other case studies and projects, um, research projects um, in different cities across America, as well as one in Canada, um, about how the repurposing of vacant lots have shown extreme success in, in many regards. Um, first on decreasing crime rates um, in vacant lots and throughout uh, the neighborhood due to like spillover effects of crime reduction. Um, and some of the most important cases were in Philadelphia. There's this guy named Bronas at UPenn um, who is uh, leading a lot of research in Philly and leading a lot of projects. He's repurposing hundreds and hundreds of vacant lots out there and um, Philly has seen a lot of changes in specific neighborhoods in terms of community relations, high school academic improvement, um, and just seeing how simple improvements to these such small spaces have such large impacts on a neighborhood and citywide community. Um, and lastly, I also took a look at the ecological benefits of vacant lots and seeing how these lots can uh, decrease you know, the urban heat island effect and also uh, stormwater storage was an interesting facet because uh, Chicago has had a history of uh, flooding in low income neighborhoods. Um, uh, flooding is quite common once the rain starts coming in um, and fl flooding in specific neighborhoods or it's basically an annual occurrence. So seeing how these soil deposits can um, not only create community community relations, but also be have ecological benefits. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this slide is to highlight the disparity um, in the concentration uh, of vacant lots in specific neighborhoods. So to your left is North Lawndale. That's my case study neighborhood. Um, I'll go into that in a second. And to your right is Lincoln Park, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, as you can see, there's a difference. I don't know if you can see it or not, um, but Lincoln Park as it stands has one vacant lot um, and North Lawndale has approximately 850 to 900 vacant lots. And uh, it's important to note that North Lawndale is smaller than Lincoln Park as well. Um, so, I mean, I want you guys to imagine like how this la urban landscape actually looks and feels as a resident of a neighborhood. If um, And an interesting note is um, as I started writing my thesis, Chicago has revamped um, their large lots program, which started in 2018, I believe. And this is to um, sell vacant lots at $1, technically, um, to Chicago residents. Um, but it, they had about a two year hiatus and started it up again once I started writing my thesis this year. Um, it's interesting to note that that one lot in Lincoln Park was for sale the whole time I was writing my thesis. Whereas all 800 to 900 vacant lots in North Lawndale, when I started in fall quarter, where none of them were up for sale, um, no one could legally buy these city owned um, lots or parcels. Um, and now through the revamping of the large lots program, about 10 to 20% of these lots are now up for sale. Um, but it's just, that's just literally what happened as I started writing my thesis. Um, so it's interesting to see how you know policies were pan panning out um, as I was working on this. Okay. Um, so why North Lawndale? So why did I choose North Lawndale to be my case study neighborhood? Um, first is uh, the high, as we've seen, the high concentration of lots and clustering of lots. Um, and 
North Lawndale has about 7% of all vacant lots um, in Chicago. As you know, there are 77 neighborhoods. If there's an even distribution, there should be no more than 1.2% of lots in North Lawndale. Um, and I also took a look at North Lawndale because they had an interesting statistic in terms of green space access. So Chicago uses a metric of two acres per 1,000 residents as um, an adequate amount of green space in a neighborhood. Um, and North Lawndale uh, in you know Chicago Park uh, Chicago Park District reports uh, meets this requirement only because they have a huge park in the edge of their neighborhood called Douglas Park um, that skews this metric and uh, allows North Lawndale to be bumped up and hit this requirement of two acres per 1,000 resident. However, if you take a look at this neighborhood and the way it's planned, Douglas Park is not necessarily accessible to most of the neighborhood. You have to cross big eight, 10 lane streets to get there. Um, walk Walkability to this park or uh, is, I mean, it depends on where you live specifically, but it's not a universal experience for all North, Lale, North Lawndale residents. And furthermore, um, they this neighborhood lacks, um, excuse me, neighborhood parks, which are it's like a different distinction of parks, smaller walkable parks throughout the neighborhood. Um, so I just wanted to see how vacant lots could alleviate this. Also, North Lawndale has a much higher percentage of children than the average um, percent of minors in Chicago. I believe Chicago average is about 22%, whereas North Lawndale was almost 29, 30%. So, um, okay. Oh, my fonts. Um, data and analysis. So I took a look uh, at my... The big chunk of data I used was um, qualitative data through my interviews. I did a, 10 interviews through um, in North Lawndale with North Lawndale residents, community leaders, churchgoers. I interviewed a pastor. Um, and um, I, also, I wanted to see the community's opinions on the vacant lots and gauge interest in um, if they would be interested in repurposing vacant lots in their neighborhood. The second part of my data was quantitative. I took a look at the public data on city-owned um, vacant lots in North Lawndale um, and taking a look at the zoning classes, which um, who are the managing organizations, uh, et cetera. And my an analysis um, was the analysis of my interviews, um, transcription and um, choosing themes from my interviews and my interviewees. Um, and the limitations of my studies are the fact that I only took a look at one case study, um, and as well as I took I took a look more specifically at the legality of this process and the process of land transfership, but I did not take a look at the economics of the project. Okay, my findings. This is a picture I took in North Lawndale um, of just a vacant lot right next to uh, an interviewee's house. Um, so I took a look at the neighborhood's relationship to vacant lots um, and my all my interviewees um, mentioned littering, um, safety, loitering, boredom, et cetera. Um, and one big issue is that these space, because these spaces have been abandoned for so long, the neighborhood community treats these spaces as spaces that have been abandoned for so long. Hence the littering. Um, there were high levels of littering um, throughout, especially between residential blocks, which I think took me by surprise. Um, and also my, it was very clear to me after my interviews that these spaces were extremely, like the residents were extremely aware of the fact that they live in this high, um, concentration of vacant lots that do not exist in different spaces in Chicago. Um, and um, there was a very felt response uh, to my interview questions um, when I was gauging, you know, opinions on uh, vacant lots. And uh, there was huge support in wanting these spaces to be re repurposed. Um, and the big part of this support is based on the fact that there are a lot of children in North Lawndale. Um, on 16th Street, which is the big street on North Lawndale, there are about like six schools spanning from preschool to, I think they have two high schools on 16th Street. Um, 
and uh, vacant lot. There are vacant lots throughout 16th Street. So the proximity to schools and children, these uh, spaces where children and adults loiter, litter. There were abandoned cars um, next to elementary schools and um, parents in my interviews were very clear to me that it it was noticeable and it made um, it created a feeling of unsafety um, as well as personal anecdotes and relationships to them which were really really powerful and I felt you know very like lucky to have been exposed to that okay so I created a policy framework that outlines um, the legal process of land transfership from the city of Chicago to the Chicago Park District the Chicago Park District is a separate taxing entity to the city of Chicago to the city of Chicago, did I say that right? Um, and so um, there can be a legal process of land transfership. So the first part, oh, and also my policy framework highlights um, how this process can be really based in the community and neighborhood and residents, starting from um, the request and application process. So a community area like North Lawndale, as I mentioned, these concentration clusterings only happen in about six or seven neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, so it would start with an application or a request. And then the second part would be deciding the location. Unlike previous green space projects where the park district just, um, is more involved in location, um, it would be up to the neighborhood to decide. And then the next part would be amenities. So like, like the previous um, step, it would be the neighborhood's decision on which amenities go where rather than the Chicago Park District. Um, this was outlined um, in my interviews as well. When I was interviewing, um, I asked people specifically what amenities they would like and where it would go. And they have a much clearer idea of what the neighborhood needs and wants than someone an outsider perspective um, can provide. Um, oh no. Then okay. The next part is creating community programs. Um, this was explored in my interview findings and my thesis. Um, but there were so many ideas from my interviewees that they had already thought through um, on which specific community programs could be created. For instance, North Lawndale has a long history of community gardens um, and after school programs that have fallen in and out, especially through COVID, a lot of them have deteriorated. But there's a strong interest in creating them again. So that was like an example amenity and um, preceding community program like in schools um, that was easily feasible in this specific neighborhood. Hence why community-based surveying for green space creation is so important. Um, and then um, it would be the transfer of land ownership from the city of Chicago to the park district. I also explore um, a piece of legislature called the Chicago Park District Act, uh, where it states that the CPD cannot deny a donation. Um, there's like a, there's a one clause in this like big piece of legislature. Um, so there is legal precedent to for this transfership and donation. Um, and then second to last is the creation of the park. Um, so if this parcel of land were to be donated to the Chicago Park District, it would be under the CPD's jurisdiction and responsibility to create this park. Um, this is all a hypothetical. It's like the large lots program. It would have to be a civic program that would be created. Um, and then lastly is upkeep. This is something that I added after my interviews and this is um, something I think I was a little short-sighted about but I learned um, uh, by meeting all these people who were really really passionate about repurposing these spaces and how important create, um, creating a path for success and continued upkeep of these spaces would be. Okay last slide. Conclusions. Um, so Solutions to land management issues through, a, I mean, I created a solution to this large scale land management issue through um, a legally viable option. Like I said, there is a legal precedent for this land transfership. Um, I think also through writing my thesis, I learned about how 
this land manage mismanagement issue and how deep it goes. I had a, a, a fight over email with many people in the Department of Public um, Planning and Development. I found a discrepancy of almost 100 vacant lots in North Lawndale um, in two public data portals, um, both of whom argue that they were correct. Um, mind you, 100, disc 100 lot of discrepancy in one neighborhood. I don't really know what that means. I don't really know what that looks like in practice, but the issue of land mismanagement is clear and it does not take a long time to figure out that, that this is going on. And I'm not proposing that all 15,000 lots should be created into green spaces. However, um, there have been so much success in repurposing one or two lots in a specific neighborhood and how much that has, um, increased community relations and again like schooling and um and uh, I just wanted to, wanted to outline how this could be possible in the west and south side of Chicago thank you okay so um to stay on track we have time for one maybe two questions for Noel I can give you the mic if you have a question start with Marnoosh here and then Nina um, I I think, uh, so this is very interesting. I think it builds on the uh, assumption that community works as a unified body. Um, so what are what are those aspects? Did you ever think about if this is going to be happening, then the community might not agree. You know, it's not like they will agree on exactly what or where or how, you know, this is uh, the, the social aspect of that. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think that was something um, that I faced during my interviews because, um, you know, different interviewees had a different vision of what the repurposing could look like. Um, however, it was for North Lawndale as an example, um, all my interviewees were really, really focused on green spaces for children next to schools and having a direction like that will also help um, the neighborhood come to an agreement on location for like I said 16th street is this big street um, on where there are a lot of schools and a lot of vacant lots in between um, and I mean like any green space or community space goes not everyone can agree um, however I think that's just something that I learned from community surveying is that there are lived stronger issues in a community that are more felt within the residents than someone from the outside can feel. Uh, because in all honesty, when I started going to North Lawndale for my interviews, I did not think that people would want vacant lots on the big street. I thought people would be more interested in um, the repurposing of residential blocks. Um, but I think, through community surveying and having motifs such as like a direction that people can go in, like it would be easier to find us one solution and like one lot to repurpose, if that makes sense. Um, this was so great. And I felt like really got to the core of both social and ecological justice. So super cool. Thank you. Um, my question was related to um, like the vacant lots themselves. So did you find when you were doing kind of your mapping that these vacant lots also included things like say homes that had been abandoned or, you know, kind of like still built structures or were you really focused more on just these kinds of empty green space? Um, and then how did that kind of change the way that some of these parks might, might be thought of or, or the way that built environment could be involved in that? Definitely. I think because I, I think I was attracted to vacant lots because they're so modular um, and they're so specific to a neighborhood. Um, and I'm sorry, let me just gather my thoughts for a second. <laughs> um, in ter um, for your question about having structures left, um, I believe that the sh city of Chicago does not um, put like a parcel of land on the specific category unless everything has been demolished. Um, there are like a lot of categories of uh, like land 
zoning policies and stuff, but it wouldn't be considered a vacant lot unless it was vacant. Um, so that is like a more specific part, like piece of land that I was looking at. I wasn't looking at all abandoned property, um, but also like Steelworkers Park, for instance, like on South Shore, that was a huge, there's a huge abandoned factory there that was repurposed into a climbing gym and that's why community involvement in creation of green spaces is so important is because people who live there know those spaces better um i also saw like children there was like there was this like big abandoned truck on um 16th street in this lot and all the parts were gone but it was basically like a climbing gym for kids and the neighborhood like had this issue of abandoned vehicles but this vehicle was not an issue for the neighborhood so hypothetically if they wanted to keep it made it you know safe for children to somehow play in um, that would be an option for them for them to propose like in this application process um, and hypothetically like you mentioned if there was like this abandoned structure and it was great and beautiful and people were already using it and utilizing it at the pseudo um, you know space of recreation then that could also fall under this hypothetical, like make my thesis is policy um, proposal. Yeah. Thanks, Noel. That was really thanks. Okay. So next up, we have uh, Micah Wilcox. Um, Micah's paper is titled "Major L: How the Chicago Transit Authority Gentrified Its Elevated Trains." And um, just a quick congrats to Micah, who's one of the finalists for the Chicago Studies Prize. Can people hear me? Oh, I can hear me. Great. I am also going to set a timer. That's right. 15 minutes. Thank you so much. My name is Michael Wilcox. I wrote my thesis, as mentioned, about the Chicago Transit Authority. It's called Major L how the CTA gentrified its elevated trains. So as is very apparent by this point, I chose to write my thesis about Chicago's elevated trains. And the reason that I did this is because I believe that the L has the ability to fulfill what I consider to be transit's promise in the United States. Transit has the ability at its best to connect communities, regardless of prior discrimination, regardless of affluence, to jobs, to education, to public services, to amenities, and in the context of climate change, to a shared sustainable future. The shared infrastructure can really link communities together and connect them to the opportunities and services needed for all residents to thrive. And the L on its surface has that potential. Due to its age and its extent across the city of Chicago, given that it's the second most ridden rail network in the country after the subway in New York in 2022, it does cover the majority of the city. It does cut across areas of historic affluence and historic discrimination and disinvestment. It has this potential to fulfill this promise, but in my study period between 2010 and 2019, it doesn't. And the reason for this lack of fulfillment is an idea that I'm going to come back to a lot in this presentation, which is that transit is only as useful as the built environment that surrounds stations. It's for this reason that I'm going to introduce a definition that I will also rely on a lot for this presentation, transit-oriented development, which is a term that really refers to buildings, infrastructure, and the like that is oriented around transit. An example would be a train station with pedestrian-friendly wide sidewalks surrounding it for a couple of blocks with apartment buildings with ground floor retail. Things that really just incentivize the use of transit 
over personal vehicles. In Chicago, the city council instituted zoning incentives that reduced the amount of parking needed, allowed for taller buildings and such around L stations in 2013 and expanded these rules in 2015. The city's own research found that between 2016 and 2019, 90% of TOD projects were built either in the Loop or West Loop or on the North and Northwest sides. 90%. Which meant that 10% was going to the South and West sides, which again, are areas that do have extensive L networks, but they did not get this built environment that really activates transit. And it was this setup that led to me being shocked by the following finding when I began my research. Looking at the north side of Chicago and the south side of Chicago, which I divided by use of census tracts and by a division of connecting tracks to their closest stations on different routes, a methodology I'll go into more later, I found disproportionate ridership and population changes on both the north side and the south side. A 2% population gain on the north side was accompanied by a nearly by an over 7% ridership increase, while a 6% decline in population on the south side was accompanied by a 20% decrease in ridership. This, to me, signaled the extent to which ridership change in the 2010s had become fully disconnected in these two regions from mere population shifts. And it's what led me to suspect that it had something to do with the provision of transit-oriented development and transit served development around stations. Investigating this further, I found that in conducting regression analysis, addressing ridership change and demographic variables at the census tract level, I found a strongly significant positive correlation between median income change and ridership change on the north side, and a weakly significant negative correlation between median income change and ridership change on the south side. So what does this mean? These changes in correlation suggest to me that more affluent riders were getting on transit on the north side and fewer affluent, less affluent riders were getting on transit on the south side. And once again, this led me to believe that the built environments in affluent neighborhoods like those on the north side had made transit more useful to riders than that in less affluent neighborhoods, which is what was driving the growth. And this led to the formation of my key argument which is that the CTA gentrified the L by leaving the built environment around stations up to market development and not the interests of equity. So I know I've said a lot, and I want to contextualize my argument in a little bit of history. And to do that, I'm going to start with a couple of definitions. The first is inferior good, which is an economic term for a good or service whose use de- increases with decreased income. Public transportation in the United States has widely been considered an inferior good given the focus on car ownership as a symbol of wealth. And on the South side, the relationship I just I just described, where as income decreased, ridership increased, is an example of the inferior good relationship. The next definition I'm going to introduce is a little more nuanced, and there are a few more layers. And that is the back to the city movement, which is a late 20th century, early 21st century movement where young, particularly affluent people, moved to cities in pursuit of what I would call the urban experience that the dense, walkable environments provided, which is to say the concentration of activities, the concentration of culture, the concentration of uses, the ability to walk down a street at night and go to different bars, to go to different restaurants, to go to different gyms, parks, houses all made possible due to the concentration within this walkable, transit-served environment that you don't see in the suburbs. This increased demand for the city, for certain neighborhoods in the late 20th, early 21st century led to an increase in property values, an increase in rents. And this was something that was noticed by city governments who really either directly took steps to create amenities themselves or took steps to let markets respond to market incentives. The example I would use that's relevant here is Chicago's TOD ordinance, which gave markets the opportunity to develop around transit according to market preferences. 
to make this a little clearer, I'm going to present the loop of the back to the city, which is young and affluent people move to the city, results in the rising property values and rents, government support for market-based growth, city is more appealing to affluent young people, rinse and repeat. So I bet you're wondering, great, what does this have to do with transportation? In the 21st century in particular, rail transit was reconceived not as just a way of getting people from point A to point B, but also as an amenity, part of the urban experience of taking a train from downtown, of riding the L. And this, again, was an experience that was activated by the built environment around transit, which is to say transit-oriented development. In other studies that I study in my literature review, there is a connection established between the presence of rail transit and gentrification. But in this study, I'm not focused on what the presence of transit does, because as I already established, merely having the L in the neighborhood really did nothing to change ridership. As I mentioned, transit is only as useful as the built environment that surrounds it. In Chicago, as established, the north side and the greater loop got the lion's share of TOD, while the south side had almost no TOD. And this is because I argue that the south side was really ignored by market development, which prioritized flow of capital to areas that were intriguing and interesting to people of capital, which is to say neighborhoods that are often associated with affluence or gentrification in the city. Lincoln Park, Wicker Park, Bucktown, Logan Square. Neighborhoods that have had a lot of outside interest, a lot of development. Those are the neighborhoods that receive the outside interest and the outside development. The South Side did not, which once again leads back to my argument that the CTA gentrified the L. This would not be a thesis without a proper methodology section. And as mentioned, I conducted regression analysis. I conducted regression analysis by splitting the city of Chicago into different regions to aggregate my analysis based on their proximity to different rail lines in the city. Because the city zoning policy that I mentioned, the TOD zoning, uses half a mile from transit as its maximum radius for its zoning incentives to take place, I also created a map where tracks within half a mile of their closest stations existed as well. In addition, I split these regions into sub-regions based on the line they were on to attempt to examine if there were line-specific events. In my thesis, I also go through exactly which stations are included in which region in order to visualize my methodology and my thinking more for my readers. I analyzed ridership's relationship to three variables. The change in median age at the tract level, the change in population at the tract level, and the change in median income at the tract level between 2010 and 2019. And once again, I came to this conclusion that for all tracts, there was a strongly significant positive correlation between median income change and ridership change. There was a weakly significant negative correlation between median income ridership, median income change and ridership change. And with this data, I once again came back to the data that informed my initial research. The disproportionate ridership change on the north side versus the south side, the presence of almost all the TOD being located in the loop or the north side. And I once again came back to a now empirically supported conclusion that the built environment surrounding transit mattered to the process of actually activating ridership. And I once again came back to my conclusion, which is that by leaving the environment around transit up to only market interests and not prioritizing equity, the CTA gentrified the L and its ridership. So what I want to conclude with is a couple of key thoughts, the first of which is an explanation of why I chose to focus on the area between 2010 and 2019, given that that is now four years ago. The L, like every other transit system in the United States, was really struggling post-COVID. But even with its challenges, it is still the second most ridden rail network in the country after New York. Moreover, 
At the start of the pandemic, the Life and Administration worked with community groups like Elevated Chicago to initiate what they called an equitable transit-oriented development plan to bring this transit-served, transit-oriented development to communities on the south side and the west side. One of the major projects is a complex surrounding the 79th Street Red Line Station, just a few miles south of campus. I know that my I have sounded dour for much of this presentation, bemoaning the fact that the CTA has gentrified its transit, but I want to end on an optimistic note, which is that I interpret my results as demonstrating the importance of the surrounding built environment to transit ridership. Moreover, I think the amenity relationship that I show as taking place on the north side between 2010 and 2019 demonstrates the promise of creating transit-served environments. The inferior good relationship that takes place on the south side demonstrates the consequences of a lack of transit-served environments, but we are in the process of, ex of building a pilot policy to change that in the ETOD policy. I see this data that I've collected as demonstrating the promise of equitable TOD that by bringing transit-served environments with community input, with community um, direction to all communities across Chicago, the L can be this equitable shared service that connects all communities to jobs, connects all communities to education, connects people to amenities, and connects people in total to a shared sustainable future. I think the takeaway is that the city should not only continue to see the ETOD policy through to completion, but it should continue to work with community groups like Elevated to expand this policy, to revise it, to grow it, and to really ensure that all, all L stations in the city have the environment surrounding them that make them useful to communities that use that station. I believe the L has the potential post COVID to achieve transit's promise and we could turn this major L into a major W. Thank you. Thanks, Micah. I feel like, Noelle, if you could just follow us around and cheer every time we, we need a little bit of encouragement. Um, so thanks, Micah. We have time for one or two questions, just depending how long the question and answers are. <laughs> so um, Laura. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I first want to say your results are really so interesting and, and even just working with you this year has like changed the way that I think about the subject. So thanks so much um, for your project. Um, you mentioned that I think median age was one of the variables that you analyzed. Um, can you talk about your results uh, for that variable and how, or am I wrong about that? Sorry. No, you're right. The oh. reason I focused on median income was because I didn't find that many significant results for median age or population. And that was something I was very surprised about. And I explore those other variables more in my analysis section, but I felt that income was the median income was the variable with the most kind of citywide and regional interesting results. And I felt that given the limited time of my presentation, I didn't have time to really explore kind of the significance of not finding that many significant conclusions on those variables. Or yeah, I was kind of wondering, I mean, um, even just uh, casually, you know, how you think um, they inform your thesis, for example, about the back to the, to the city movement, if you could talk a bit about that. Absolutely. I expected to see a strong correlation between median age and ridership. I expected that stations would be surrounded by tracks with younger people and tracks that got younger over time. And while there were, I believe, a few specific results that showed that, at, I think the line-specific results there wasn't anything at the regional level to demonstrate to say that, oh, the north side got younger. And as a result, it's ridership that was correlated with the ridership in the way that income was strongly correlated with ridership. So I think to an extent, I think it nuances the idea that it's only young people taking transit. And I think it's a subject that require that is definitely warranting further study, especially post-pandemic, I'd love to see more research. And I mentioned this in my conclusion about kind of understanding how age stratifies transit use, especially thinking about it now in terms of physical accessibility. Since Laura had a two-part question, I'm going to move on. And uh, But you can find Micah afterwards outside and ask more, more questions. Um, 
Thank you, Micah. That was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so next up we have our Chicago Studies Prize winner, Isadora Crone. Um, <laughs> Who always has a great cheering section. I love it. Um, a Tale of Two Rivers, Zoning Policy Conflict and the Production of Public Space on the Chicago River. everyone if you wanted to take photos and especially of the posters and their presenters and share it with us we can collect all those for social media and showcase them thank you send it to uh, carla send it to carlo <laughs> uh pictures for social media oh yeah what's your uh, email address yes. carlo diaz at uchicago.edu Thank you. Thanks, Carla. Okay. I should say that I have a crippling fear of microphones, so. Oh, beautiful. All right, am I good to go? All right, um, hello everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today I will be presenting uh, my thesis project, which I titled A Tale of Two Rivers, Zoning Policy Conflict and the Production of Public Space on the Chicago River. So I wanna start off by talking a little bit about how I became interested in the Chicago River. Um, I've spent the past four years rowing with U Chicago's club rowing team um, out of a place called Park 571, which is a park on the South Branch of the Chicago River. Um, and this is in a highly industrial area of the Chicago River. Some of our immediate neighbors are an asphalt production facility, a chicken meat packing plant, um, and like a Amazon warehouse. So there really is a, unique land use um, present in that area of the river and our presence there oftentimes feels like it's in conflict with that land use. So this photo here is of me and Daniela who's in the back there rowing um, next to the Amtrak train depot um, on the south branch of the river. So I was initially very interested in the contradictions um, in both the design and the uses that are present in this area of the river. Um, you have these manufacturing and industrial uses, you have recreational activities like rowing, like kayaking, like fishing, which is a little sketchy to me, but you see it a lot. Um, and then as I spent more time on the river, I also became very aware of kind of the wildlife and ecology that is also present in this highly industrial area of the river. You see fish, you see beavers and muskrats, which is beyond me as well. Um, and also just the most incredible types of birds that I've ever seen in this city. So it is a really unique space with all these different uses and ecologies that all kind of seem to contradict or be in conflict with each other. So I was initially interested in whether people view the Chicago River as a natural space um, and if these contradicting uses of the river kind of change or inform perceptions of the river as a natural space. But as I kind of got started with my research, um, I realized that a lot of the uses of the Chicago River are not just dictated by perceptions or uses or choices, but also just by the zoning policy that dictates the land use of those areas of the river. So I kind of switched gears and became interested in this document, the zoning document called the Chicago River Design Guidelines, which inform um, the design and use of all riverfront land in the city of Chicago. 
and I became interested in how th this zoning document aligns or conflicts with zoning documents that are relevant to specific areas along the river in producing and ensuring access to public space. Um, and what I ultimately argue in my paper is that through its diverging zoning policies, the city of Chicago has engendered spatial inequality in the city by promoting the intensification of polluting industrial activity on the south branch of the river in order to facilitate the ecological restoration and the redevelopment of land on the north branch of the river. So a little bit of background, the Chicago River is a highly industrial waterway um, and most of its current form that we see today is actually man-made. So in the early 19th century, um, the Chicago River was essentially built by dredging a canal um, to drain the swampland that the city of Chicago originally sat on. Um, and then in 1900, the Chicago River, the flow of the river was reversed. And this was done to allow for waste disposal into the river. Um, the river originally flowed into the lake, um, which was contaminating the city's drinking water source. So um, the Chicago Ship and Sanitary Canal, which is um, the straight shot that goes southwest out of the river, um, was built to connect the Chicago River to the Des Plaines River, ultimately out to the Mississippi River. And this allowed um, the city of Chicago to continue dumping waste, sending it out to St. Louis um, without polluting our drinking water. Um, and importantly, this engineering choice is really what allowed for Chicago to grow and develop as the industrial hub that really put it on the map. So this allowed for um, industry to exist along the Chicago River and very specifically allowed for the Chicago meat packing industry, which was really like the biggest industry in this city, um, was very important to its history and its formation. And this engineering choice was really what facilitated the growth of that industry. Um, today, the city of Chicago is home to uh, a lot of industry still. Um, including uh, industrial corridors, which are designated zoning areas that um, explicitly are set aside for industrial activity. Some of these are even more specifically designated as planned manufacturing districts, which explicitly prohibit non-industrial activity. So there are zoning laws in place that really secure indus industrial activity within the city and, and make it difficult to do anything else in those areas. Um, and I chose to focus my research on two specific areas of the river, the North Branch Zone um, and the South Branch Zone. These are two historically industrial areas of the river, um, but they have both experienced kind of diverging development in the past 10, 15 years. The North Branch Zone was originally home to um, Finkel Steel and General Iron. Um, and uh, when those uh, industries closed, um, there was a huge kind of land accumulation in that area, and the North Branch Zone is now being redeveloped um, into one area of it is what will soon be Lincoln Yards, which is the largest real, real estate development in Chicago's history. Um, meanwhile, on the South Branch Zone, you have continued intensification of um, industry and manufacturing. Um, and I just want to read a quote. Um, from the Chicago River Design Guidelines, which, um, as I said, are the policy that dictates land use on the river. Um, and the point of this policy was to, quote, reclaim the river as an aesthetic and recreational resource to improve the quality of life for all Chicagoans. So the river is kind of viewed as this amenity, but um, land treatment on either uh, of the study zones are kind of different um, depending on other conflicting uses in those areas. So this is just really quickly a map of all um, industrial zones in the city of Chicago. And then I just pointed out, we have the North Branch Industrial Corridor, which is no longer called that on the up north. And then I had the three relevant zones that I looked at on the South Branch. This is just a close up of the North Branch Zone. The Northern uh, bear, uh, border is at Fullerton Avenue, and then it goes all the way south to Wolf Point, which is where the river splits into three in the loop. And then this is a close up of um, the Pilsen Industrial Corridor, which is one of the industrial corridors on the South Branch that I looked at. Just to orient you a little bit, I have a mark there out of the boathouse where the U Chicago crew team rose out of. And you can see that literally our immediate neighbors are Kugel Foods, which is a meatpacking plant, um, Amazon Distribution Center, and then the Damon Silos. If you've ever exited off of I-55 um, at the Damon exit, you've seen these abandoned silos. They were featured in the Transformers movie once. Um, and in the fall, the state of Illinois uh, sold them to Matt Asphalt and they're gonna be demolishing them and constructing an asphalt production facility there. So just really briefly, I wanna go into um, 
kind of the literature that I looked at throughout my project. I'm not going to go too far deep into this, but um, one of the things that I looked at was um, the importance of green space in cities. I think we can all agree that green space is an important amenity. Um, it has benefits kind of for me mental health, physical and public health, um, and also ecological health of urban spaces as well. Um, one thing that I really looked at in my paper and that uh, I think is a very interesting argument that I did expand more in my writing is that urban ecosystems can take many different forms and can also exist and coexist with kind of industrial and post-industrial landscapes. I think the South Branch of the Chicago River is a great example of this. Um, and so as we think about urban green space, it's important to think about the ecologies that are already present and how these ecologies can kind of be protected and conserved and um, expanded upon going forward um, instead of like completely eliminating an existing urban ecology to build like a quote unquote green space that is also a highly engineered environment. So I think that there it requires an expansive definition of green space. And I talk a little bit more in my paper about what that could look like. Um, I also was interested in the potential for urban waterfronts as existing public space. And um, in my paper, I did a kind of went into a case study of the Copenhagen Harbor Baths, which um, was a development in Copenhagen that turns turned a once polluted kind of industrial waterway into a really popular location for swimming and just hanging out and spending time. Um, I was also really interested in parks and public space as drivers of gentrification. There's famous examples of um, public space promoting gentrification and displacement in cities. Two notable examples are the High Line in New York City and the 606 Trail here in Chicago. Um, through my reading, what I found is that one way that parks and the creation of public space can reduce its impact on gentrification is in reducing like the architectural intervention or the upkeep that are necessary to per, like continue the use of these areas. So just by reducing cost, but also um, this reduces the tendency for some public spaces to become like destinations where people travel to a place to see a public space. Um, and then you get all this outside presence and neighborhood shift and demographic change. So parks should really come as like community resources instead of as outside destinations. Um, and finally, I looked into zoning as a tool for public space creation. Um, zoning has historically been used to create public space in the form of what are called privately owned public spaces or what I call POPs. Um, these were first introduced in New York City with pretty limited success, but they can be successful with a lot of kind of guidelines and oversight by city governments. Um, one important thing about POPs though, is that they do have the potential to create what's called, what I call filtration or like filtration devices um, where the use or access of those public spaces is limited by the nature of them being private. So one great example of this is like a public kind of plaza area where there is seating and there's also like a coffee shop and it's up to debate about whether or not seating in that public plaza is limited to just people that are paying customers of that coffee shop. So there can be filtration devices such as that that limit the type of person that is able to access the space or the ways that they're able to use that space. So I went into three different zoning policies. You have the Chicago River Design Guidelines, which I already went into, the North Branch Framework Plan, which rezoned the North Branch to eliminate its plan manufacturing district status. Um, and this allowed for the real estate development that is currently taking place along the North Branch. Um, it's important to note that even before this passed, there had been extensive speculative, speculative land accumulation on the North Branch. So real estate developers had already been accumulating land in that area. And then I looked at the draft Little Village Framework Plan, which was a draft zoning plan that was published in 2019. This was never revisited. Um, it has never passed. But I chose to look at it anyway because I do think that it indicates the direction that zoning is going in the South Branch. And importantly, that direction is kind of no change from the status quo. Um, and this draft had really negative community feedback. Um, so the community is kind of in favor of a rezoning or a re-envisioning of the South Branch of the river. Um, these were kind of my methods, the, frame, the questions that I asked um, about all these different policies and how they interacted with each other. Um, two important frameworks that I kind of relied on were a study conducted in 1998 that basically asked Chicago residents what they would like to see from the river in order to re-envision it as a public space. Um, they really, you know, re residents wanted to see public amenities, they wanted to see ecological features, and they wanted to see better water quality, that's very important. 
Um, and then I also really relied on the concept of a sacrifice zone, which is a place that is kind of sacrificed to toxic pollution in order to allow for the continuation of carbon intensive capitalist activities elsewhere without having to deal with the consequences in that immediate zone. So that concept I kind of came to apply to the South Branch of the River. Um, my analysis was pretty extensive, but I think there's kind of two main points that I really want to drive home. The first was that a really important component of all three of these zoning policies is that the city of Chicago offered to financially support the um, movement of industrial activity from the North Branch Zone to the South Branch Zone or to other areas of the river. Um, so in doing that and writing that into policy, the city kind of explicitly said, like, we will sacrifice these other areas um, in order to create this area that is conducive to a certain type of kind of white collar knowledge economy work and residence in the North Branch Zone. So there is this, this sacrificing of other areas of the river in order to achieve this kind of redevelopment goal on the North Branch. Um, and then also that um, all of the public space created by these different policies, um, notably like the Chicago River Design Guidelines requires a 30-foot setback from the river and a publicly accessible path in any development um, on the Chicago River. But all of this public space that is created is um, privately owned public space, which means that the people that own those plots of land are able to filter users of the space as they see fit, um, either by, you know, um, creating, you know, needing to pay to access amenities or um, closing areas at night, you know, policing or sec having security forces as they see fit. So um, there's no creation of actual public space on the river under any of these plans. And I think one thing that's very important to note is that um, there's a lot of encouragement to create um, like amenities, like public restrooms um, along the river by encouraging um, businesses such as like coffee shops or like amenity businesses, as I call them, to be developed on on riverfront land. But the plan manufacturing district designation of the South Branch explicitly prohibits that type of development. So on the North Branch, you can have, you know, coffee shops with public restrooms and with snacks and with places to sit. And even though those are privately owned spaces, so there is a filtration mechanism present in that, those are still amenities that people can use. But even that privately owned you know, amenity is explicitly banned on the South Branch of the river. So there's just this barrier to creating like really functional public space on the South Branch that is like, that barrier is just purely based in the zoning policy that dictates the land use of the area. And so finally, um, I wanna talk a little bit about my recommendations. Um, I'm really interested in this concept of like industry in Chicago and and what that could look like. Um, this photo here is from an architecture firm called Urban Lab. They have this proposal um, of building infrastructure that it will, would allow for kind of like clean industry that takes advantage of Chicago's positioning um, on Lake Michigan and having just abundant access to fresh water. Um, and I think that's a really unique vision. In general, I think that public policy could be used to encourage a shift in industrial activity, so towards more like electrified, non-polluting industry, um, just generally having like more environmental regulation on the type of industry that can exist in the city, um, and that maybe could make industry more friendly to proximity to public space, because as it currently exists, it's just really impossible to access public space on the river adjacent to industry in any type of safe or enjoyable way. Um, I also propose pedestrianizing the land around the river um, to just kind of reduce conflict between industrial use and pedestrians. So, you know, pedestrians should not be interacting with semi trucks trying to just go ride their bike with their kids, you know, along the river. Um, and then I also argue that the city should halt the practice of selling publicly owned riverfront land to private developers. So if there's this vision of the river as a public space, um, the city should double down on their publicly owned land that they own on the river and and develop that um, to be truly public, um, as well as strengthening kind of affordable housing policy and just social schemes so that communities can retain their identity even as they become more pleasant places to live um, via the creation of public space on the river. Uh, just to conclude, um, as I said, this, the Chicago River is like one system. And so in the re redevelopment of one area of the river, there has been this sacrifice of another area of the river, um, which kind of shows, I think, policy priority and also um, kind of eliminates the 
agency of people who live in proximity to the South Branch and who have just as much of a right to, you know, pleasant use of the Chicago River as a public space. Um, but I also do want to say that claiming the Chicago River as a public asset is possible. The popularity of recreational activities of the river shows that um, there's desire for it, but it just would require carefully designed policy that is a lot more comprehensive economically, socially, and spatially than the policy that is currently um, in use to dictate public space on the river. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Isadora. Um, we have time for a question or two. Other side of the room. Marnish has one. Thank you. I wonder if your uh, project kind of ties to what Michael was talking about. Um, it seems to me a similar concept that the creation of increasing creation of amenities, whether it's by the river, basically by the thoroughfares, right? Or the L train, or um, or any anywhere else, you know, it's the same policy and same problem. You know? Yeah, for sure. So one thing that I was really interested in as I was doing my research is actually like how explicitly the city of Chicago uses zoning policy to promote like neoliberal development, the type of development that Micah was mentioning. Um, they actually in the Chicago River Design Guidelines quote this like study by the Brookings Institute called "Creating Like." Uh, innovation zones is what it was called where basically like there's this whole policy document that says like um you know people that work for tech companies and white collar jobs want you know these types of amenities and oftentimes they want like a like that zone to be rooted in like a natural feature so then the chicago city of chicago saw that and was like perfect the chicago river is it and that's like what inspired the redevelopment of the north branch so i think it's all coming from a general kind of political approach that was especially prevalent under Rahm Emanuel's administration. I talk about this more in my paper that um, there was just this desire to elevate the city of Chicago on like the world stage as like a destination for corporations and for certain types of workers. And as a result, there was um, a lot of investment into specific areas, including the area around the north branch of the river. Um, but a lot of that, as Micah really argued really eloquently in his paper, was came at the kind of expense or at the disregard of other areas of the city that weren't targeted with that treatment of creating those types of zones of innovation. Thank you. Another question? I was going to take it, but I'll... <laughs> um, So Chicago has this history as a manufacturing city and still is a place where um there's pretty significant union um political power at least compared to other cities um so i'm wondering how much in in your studies of these dynamics you encountered kind of pushback of the idea of deindustrializing um some of these zones as those are spaces for you know for blue collar jobs and that kind of thing yeah so i think that there is like two tensions at play in this obviously like there is a huge union presence in this city and that is like a very important political power. But also what I found as I read about specifically the little village industrial zone rezoning draft um, and the community feedback from that was that a lot of little village residents were really, really against um, that draft proposal and also in general are pretty against the presence of industry in the, or at least the presence of the type of industry that currently exists in their neighborhood being there. It's like very polluting. They have like elevated public health, you know, risk outcomes, et cetera. And also they kind of argue that the jobs that are present in those industries actually don't pay very well and are not really great jobs for the community. That being said, I didn't like, I don't know to what extent there is like an alternative argument coming from members of the union. So I probably, you know, there, there's definitely more research that could be done into that. But I think that one thing that like I want to drive home though is that um like industry is a really important part of you know this city. And as I was writing my paper, I was kind of like on this like anti-industry kind of mentality. And my advisor really pushed me to think more deeply about what eliminating industry from this city would look like. And in doing that, I kind of came to this conclusion that like 
this city is uniquely positioned to have a really unique type of industry, like with the proper infrastructure investment. So industry could just be like completely reimagined in Chicago to be like really clean, really unique and, you know, uniquely successful because of the natural resources that we have access to here. So I think that even like a re-envisioning of industry in Chicago would not necessarily have to come at the expense of, you know, unionized workers that currently work in these industries and ultimately could be beneficial, I think, for everyone. Indeed, thank you. Thanks, Isidore.